Good afternoon. My name is Jim Martin, and I am Associate Dean in the Bowler School of Business at John Carroll University. On behalf of John Carroll's president, Father Robert Niehoff of the Society of Jesus, I would like to welcome you to another outstanding offering in the Mellon Speaker Series. The Speaker Series is sponsored by the Bowler School of Business's Edward J. and Louise E. Mellon Chair in Finance, which was established in 1984 through a grant from the Mellon Foundation. Edward and Louise Mellon were lifelong residents of the greater Cleveland community, and they shared a commitment to the Cleveland community and its institutions. They believed that their resources came from the community and therefore should return to the community to support its institutions, in particular, education and healthcare. Through the Mellon's generous support, we are able to bring to campus chief executive officers of Ohio-based publicly traded companies to discuss the strategic focus of their companies and the challenges that they face. The Boulder School of Business strives to provide the best in undergraduate and graduate management education. To this end, our programs combine instruction in cutting-edge business theory with opportunities for students to experience firsthand the application of those theories in practice. The Mellon series is an outstanding example of this practice. In addition, the Bowler School as an institution of higher education recognizes its responsibility to provide opportunities to the community for lifelong learning, and the Mellon series is a natural vehicle for that purpose. Today, we welcome Travel Centers of America as the company selected for our Spring 2014 Mellon Series. And now let me introduce Dr. Leroy Brooks, holder of the Edward J. and Louise E. Mellon Chair in Finance, to introduce our distinguished speaker. First, this message to the students, please stay seated until the end of the closing remarks. Uh, you will be able to make your 6.30 class if you have one, so we'll get you out of here on time. Now for the purpose of the presentation, Mr. Thomas O'Brien, planning to be our 58th Mellon Series presenter, is not able to be here today due to an unfortunate emergency situation arising yesterday. We are very pleased to have Mr. Richard Michael, I'm sorry, Jay Lombardi, effectively the last minute pinch hitter, I would call it, from Travel Centers of America uh, to provide the presentation. Mike Lombardi is the Executive Vice President of Sales and Fuel Supply for Travel Centers of America. His team's duties involve managing the outside and inside sales organization, overseeing the customer service, functions of fleet operations and managing fuel supply. Mike is a Northeast Ohio native with Akron and Maslin as former boyhood homes. He's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy in West Point in 1974 with a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. He spent five years of active duty at uh, Benning, Georgia at Fort Knox and Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mike earned his MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business in 1980. Mike began his career in 1981, working with Standard Oil Company of Ohio. In 1998, he joined the Ford Motor Company until 2005. He joined Travel Centers of America in 2006 as Senior Vice President and was named Executive Vice President a year later. Mike serves as chairman of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators Governmental Affairs Committee. Mike is married and resides in Michigan and has three children. Now on Mr. Thomas O'Brien's background, CEO of the company. <clears throat> Let's see, sorry about that. He is a managing, uh, he is a Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer, and President of Travel Centers of America, LLC, a publicly traded Ohio-based corporation. 
He has been a managing director since 2006 and became president and CEO in 2007. Since May 1996, he was also simultaneously been with Risk uh, R I'm sorry, REIT Management Research LLC, which is an institutional manager of public companies such as Travel Centers of America. REIT, the company, also manages real estate as a public real estate investment trust, or REIT. In his role with REIT Management and Research, Thomas has served as Executive Vice President since September 2008. Mr. O'Brien has held many other positions with public entities engaged by REIT Management or its affiliates. This includes CEO and President of RMR Funds, which is a group of publicly traded closed end investment management companies from 2003 to 2007, and Executive Vice President of Hospitality Properties Trust, 2000 to 2003 and Treasurer and Chief Financial Officer, 96 through 2002. From 1988 to 1996, Mr. O'Brien was a senior manager with Arthur Anderson, where he served a number of public company clients. In outside roles serving his profession and the community, Mr. O'Brien is Treasurer and Director of the National Association of Truck Stop Operators, a director of Variant X Holding Corporation since 2007, and since 2008, a director of Christian Relief Services, a charitable organization providing humanitarian services around the world. Mr. O'Brien graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business with a BS in economics, and uh, now back to Mike Lombardi, and the presenting and his presentation for Travel Centers of America. We are very pleased to have you here today at John Carroll to represent Mr. Thomas O'Brien as our 58th speaker and to tell us about Travel Centers of America. Please welcome Mr. Michael Lombardi. It's time. Good afternoon and uh, thanks to everybody uh, in the meeting room today. Uh, Dean Martin, uh, Dr. Brooks, thank you so much for the uh, introductions on behalf of myself personally and as well as our company. Uh, I do want to express Tom O'Brien's sincere regrets. Uh, he could not be here today and I know he was looking forward to this because he was actively working on this presentation uh, for the last couple of weeks. So I hope you'll uh, bear with me as I uh, try to pinch hit. And, uh, share with you uh, what I hope to be a very uh, uh, sound and, and uh, uh, concise overview of our company. Uh, we're very proud of our Northeast Ohio heritage uh, and it brought with me a little help today. Uh, Mr. Ara Bagdasarian, one of my fellow executive vice presidents here in the front row, Ara. He's also a John Carroll alumnus so we kind of wanted to make sure he was here to represent you guys well. And Mr. Uh, Tom Litkus, our vice president of marketing and public affairs. So. Uh, these guys are going to make sure I stay on track. Um, thanks to all of you. Uh, I'd hate to run late and have you be late for class. I know how tough that would be for you, but I'll do my best. Uh, hopefully there's no tests you have to do today. Um, as you walked in today, hopefully you got a little handout that talks about our industry. Uh, and I think I'd like to just start with that, because if you're like me or some of my family members or my neighbors, we take what happens with the trucking industry for granted and often the only interaction you might have is whizzing down the highway seeing some 18 wheeler either go past you or be a problem you're trying to get around or whatever and you, you kind of say to yourself under your breath oh, I get that truck out of the way I need to get to where I'm going right but let me ask you just by a show of hands how many of you here this morning either in your dorm room or in the cafeteria or at home had a good breakfast you had some kind of juice or coffee or grabbed a roll or whatever, right? And chances are you had a lunch and hopefully you're going to have some kind of a dinner here later today. But if you pause and think about that, all of the goods and food that you consumed probably came in by truck to either a restaurant or the cafeteria or commissary here or a supermarket where you or your family member 
uh, grab that. And we just take it for granted that those shelves are going to be filled every day, whether it's a perishable item or a, a solid item that has no uh, expiration date. But all of those things come in those big trucks that you see going whizzing by the highway, and I think we so, so often forget about that. That's the world we live in, Tom, Mara, myself, Tom O'Brien. So when I go down the highway these days, I see my customers on the sides of those trucks. Their names are Swift and Schneider and Landstar and, and other such names, and, and that's commerce happening. You may see all those uh, ads lately by the railroads, uh, Burlington Northern and uh, uh, the other guys. They would like you to believe that most of the stuff that comes by trucks can eventually come by rail. And they've made quite a bit of progress, but to date, uh, still about 70 to 80 percent of the goods you and I consume come via trucks, even though rail continues to help on longer distances. So keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, I think with that, let me grab my pointer here. What I want to cover today is just a little bit about the big view of, of uh, Travel Centers of America. Importantly for me is to talk to you about our culture and how we go to market. Um, and then I'll open it up for comments or discussions. Travel Centers of America, uh, you may ask yourself, why is it here in Ohio? So let me just kick that off real quick. Um, uh, as Dr. Brooks mentioned, uh, both myself, Tom Lutkus, and, and Ara Bagdasarian started our careers with something called the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. I see a few alumni of, of that company here in the room as well today. Um, used to be known as Sohio, uh, based downtown Cleveland. And in 1984, that company purchased uh, what was then a very small activity called Truck Stops of America from a company today that's known as Ryder, R-Y-D-E-R, still a very vibrant public company. And we took their uh, uh, handful of truck stops and merged them with our handful of truck stops and we were in the truck stop business. And I can remember to this day sitting in meetings, guys talking about how many pairs of blue jeans were sold at truck stops. We had no idea that next to J.C. Penney's we were the number two retailer of blue jeans in the country. We wouldn't think of that kind of stuff today. Uh, but that was new, a new uh, business venture for us. We fast forward to 1994, by then we were owned by British Petroleum. The uh, oil industry had, uh, had uh, fallen in terms of the cost of crude oil. And the consultants had all come in and said uh, the truck stop business was not a core business. If that sounds familiar, you'll, you'll see that cycle as you read the business papers every day. So uh, suddenly we were a non-core business. The business was spun off and uh, went through two cycles of private equity, remained in Cleveland, and to this day the core of uh, our employee base are all alumni of the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. Uh, we're kind of a hidden secret. We're over in Westlake, Ohio. We uh, moved out of the what was then called the BP building uh, uh, in the mid to late 90s there. Uh, you probably have heard of some of our main competitors, particularly here in Cleveland and particularly in the last couple of years. We have three main competitors. Uh, one is known as Pilot Flying J, based in Knoxville, Tennessee, and one is known as the Love's uh, Travel Stop chain out of Oklahoma City. The other two uh, companies are privately held, so you don't read too much about them. We are a publicly held company and obviously have lots of routine uh, financial filings and those sorts of things. Um, so that gives you a, a quick overview. You can see from the slide we have lots of locations, uh, a lot of land at each of our locations, and I, I characterize our facilities as like a mini city at each, uh, at each site. You can see here we have uh, uh, a bit of a mix of architecture around the country. Um, some of that comes from our heritage uh, as growth through acquisition. Uh, we've acquired a variety of chains and merged with other chains over the years. That gives us kind of a non-standard, non-cookie cutter footprint. But we often use that to our advantage because if you're a truck driver out on America's highways today, uh, you may stop at one of our facilities as often as two or three times a day. Uh, you may get on the road at four in the morning. Uh, being parked at one of our facilities, uh, grab a, a juice or a coffee, get on the road, uh, travel for a couple of hours, make a, a fuel stop and or a, a pit stop, grab some lunch at another facility hundreds of miles away, 
And then at the end of your day, you may find one of our other our facilities somewhere else, so several hundred miles down the road, and, and have your evening meal and park and your mandated rest. So uh, uh, we try to keep that variety in mind because just like you or I, it would be a little boring to go to the same facility with the same look every, every day and have the same menu. And I'll talk about how we vary our menu items as well going forward. This slide uh, gives you a flavor for where we are around the country. And uh, no surprise, our footprint mimics that of the major interstate highways but also we tune that footprint uh, based on the flow of uh, freight in the, in the U.S. Uh, as you can see, the freight flows are very heavy in the Midwest and east of the Mississippi. Uh, those of you that drive from here to Florida know all about all those trucks on the highway. Uh, and obviously with uh, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, there's a lot of flow of goods, particularly these days, between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico in that north-south run particularly in the auto industry and a few others where they'll uh, do some sourcing of uh, components and materials in Mexico and or Canada and move them back and forth. I think one of the things that if, if I uh, don't leave you with anything else I want you, you to make sure is uh, we have large facilities. Um, the average TA offers uh, about 200 parking spaces on about 25 acres of land. Uh, while our other competitors are uh, considerably smaller. And in these days, as I'll point out in, in a few slides going forward, parking is a, is a commodity that's a, very much a premium these days. Um, we have the strongest truck repair service offering in the industry. My colleague, Mr. Bagdasarian, uh, runs the truck service business for us. He's been instrumental in growing that business and expanding it, and I'll touch on that in a few slides. Uh, in addition, we offer quite a variety of, of food service uh, operations. Uh, what you would call fast food, uh, we call it QSRs, or quick serve restaurants. Uh, they are names that I'll show you in a, in a minute here, familiar, you're familiar with. Um, but we also offer a full sit down table service restaurant offering. And we run all these operations ourselves. So much like the gasoline business over the years, um, those of us with gray hair can remember um, Slide. Uh, those of us with gray hair can remember when service stations, we used to call them, offered gasoline and automotive repair businesses and then have slowly all morphed into what we call today convenience stores. In the truck stop industry, somewhat the same has happened, but we've always been the true full service facility, still offering all those services and amenities in our business model. Now this next slide um, is always one of my favorites. Um, this is an industry where we can truly say that size matters. And I don't usually name our competitors in these photographs, but let me give you a hint. Um, the competitor on the lower right, you could probably go in there and find some Cleveland Browns merchandise. And by the way, I should have told you guys, I'm a different Mike Lombardi than the one that's been in the Cleveland Plain Dealer the last few months, and I had nothing to do with Lawyer Tillman in 1989. Um, if you think of, of the average truck that's out there, uh, the standard box trailer is about 53 feet long, and you've put a tractor uh, in front of that, we call that part of the truck where the driver sits with the engine, that's the tractor, not to be confused with the farm tractor. Um, those average anywhere from uh, 30 to 15 feet, depending on the configuration with a sleeper cab or whatever. So if you think of that uh, vehicle and its trailer. It's roughly 60 to 70 feet long. It needs a lot of space to move around. It's like moving around a, a small regional jet at Hopkins Airport. And you think about how, how they have to be careful not to knock into things. Obviously they have wings. But a truck is much the same way. And so we design our facilities to make sure there's plenty of maneuverability room and ingress and egress. Particularly we separate the ingress and egress from our passenger car vehicle. We call those four-wheelers. The stuff you and I, when we pull in and get gasoline or we're on vacation, we have a separate entrance and exit for that traffic, and we segregate it from the truck traffic in back, because we don't want to have those two uh, flows uh, intermingling. It's not a good, uh, good thing. Now, how does that work for us, again, as an advantage, um, uh, 
just the type of things we do. Well, trucking, um, one of our key strengths is service. We've always maintained a strong position in the service business. In fact, we are the strongest uh, service chain out on the uh, interstate highways for heavy duty trucks. We're the only one that has been authorized uh, over the years to do what we call dealer warranty repairs for the largest brand in the industry, and that's the Freightliner brand. And that's a, a very strong attribute and a unique opportunity for us. We take it very seriously. And again, I tip my hat to Mr. Bagdasarian who engineered that activity for us a few years ago. But it allows us to go out into the marketplace when we're selling our goods and services to fleets. Um, for them, they can't afford to be tied up for a minor repair at a traditional truck dealer where they might have to wait as long as two or three days to get into the service bays and have a repair done. We, on the other hand, uh, offer 24 hours a day, seven day a week, 365 day a week service, and we can get you in and out. From, we, we characterize ourselves as the urgent care center on the highway for heavy duty trucks. We're not the surgical uh, operating room at the hospital. So generally we're looking for repairs of two hours or less, and we get folks in and out back on the road with a certifiable warranty repair, and that's what customers want in this business. Just while I think about it, some of the numbers that might help you with this particular part of our business. We have over 3,000 technicians. We have our own training facility, uh, both in Nashville, Tennessee, and here at uh, Lodi, Ohio, just south of Cleveland. We continuously win awards for our technicians. There's competition every year, and our, our techs uh, come away with their share of the hardware each and every year. We're very proud of them. Um, and our gentleman there on the lower left, Homer Hogg, that is his real name, by the way, we didn't make that up, he's become kind of a cult hero in the trucking industry. If you happen to listen, as some of us weird people do, to uh, Truckers Radio Network on Sirius, uh, he does a regular show that drivers listen to and they call in and he's always uh, gets kudos on his uh, knowledge of truck repairs and, and good solid advice. So he's another extension of our brand and we're pleased to have him. Any marketing students in the room? I know most of this crowd is probably finance. Oh good, good, good. So one of the things you'll, you might hear about in marketing is uh, taking a brand and brand extension, leveraging that brand and its halo to other goods and products and services. We've sort of done that with our truck service operation. We have a very good reputation for truck service within our, our brick and mortar facilities, if I can call them that, our service bays at the locations. Uh, from that, we decided we could be in the emergency repair business and we created a brand called Road Squad. What Road Squad is, and it's not, it's not a towing company. It is like an ambulance that goes out and helps to fix the truck while it's on the side of the road. We set up flashers and, and safety triangles and things like that. Um, and we get the truck driver back on the road so he or she can get to their next destination. Um, it's an important part of our business, but from that, we took that same brand and extended it because it already had a great reputation. And we said, you know what, there are folks that need that kind of service where we don't have the brick and mortar facilities. So we carefully vetted um, uh, independent repair facilities around the country who meet our standards and who basically uh, work within our warranty framework. And we call that brand Road Squad Connect. And that allows us to compete with uh, numerous other industry repair um, call centers around the country who don't have any brick and mortar like we do. And so now we're taking that industry or that segment of the industry on with our Road Squad Connect brand. From that activity, we listened to our customers who told us, there's a lot of times when I don't see my own trucks because I'm on a dedicated route with uh, a Target or Home Depot and they want my trucks to go back and forth between their stores and their warehouse and I need to make sure that those trucks are properly maintained and certified in case they get pulled over for a, a DOT inspection on the highway. So we, we thought about that and we created Road Squad on-site maintenance, pictured there on the uh, lower right. That's a new and further extension of our service brand and it's been very well received. We rolled that out about a year ago and it's doing quite well and we see that as another uh, extension of our service activity. Let's talk about 
food. Uh, in addition to our truck service business, we're very big in the food service and operation of food activities business. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, variety is the name of the game. So if you look on the lower left, uh, lots of different brands there that we represent. And unlike some of our competitors who generally will, will uh, basically lease out some of their space to a franchisee who might run a McDonald's or a uh, Subway or whatever, in our case, we are the franchisee of all of those brands. We actively run them uh, on a daily basis, which means we have to get certified and go through all of their training programs and meet their, their uh, criteria for each of those brands. It's a very complex activity, but we're very proud of doing it. Um, and then at the same time, um, again, as you think of your daily activity in the morning, you might grab something quick, either a sandwich or a a coffee and a juice at one of these kinds of places. We have, uh, we have grab and go, we call it in our convenience store, I'll point to that in a second. But at the end of the day, you might want a sit down meal. You don't want fast food or quick serve food. So we also offer the full serve restaurants. Our brand, uh, the Iron Skillet and Country Pride are well known within the truck stop industry. And uh, some of you may have heard that sometimes the best places to eat on the road are the truck stops. And I would vouch for that. We have some excellent meals. We get very good feedback from our drivers on all of that. In fact, we have contests every year where drivers get to nominate their favorite menu. It might have been their mom's lasagna or uh, beef stroganoff. And we have a contest where we take the winners of those menus and we actually serve those in some of our restaurants every year. So we try to make it um, uh, an inviting place. When you're on the road every day, some of us are in sales and you eat at a lot of hotels and chain restaurants, you look for variety and, and a sense of home cooking whenever you get a chance for it. And so that's what we try to do. Convenience stores. Each of our facilities has its own convenience store. And we're different from the traditional 7-Eleven or Circle K or that kind of an operation because our, our stores are generally about twice the size. Uh, anywhere from uh, five to uh, 7,000 square feet. Um, and we have a unique offering of our products that we stock. So if you're driving that 53-foot trailer down the highway and you remember that it's your wife's birthday coming up on Saturday and you've got to get a, a present for her, or something uh, on your truck, uh, a particular electronic item went out during the week, and you need a repair for it. You just can't pull into the Auto Zone or the uh, Target store with that truck. So we listen to our customers and we try to provide a, a wide variety of items within these stores so that it helps them, uh, just like you and me, they have their, their, uh, their needs during the week, family related and, and other things like that. We try to provide that offering in our stores. A couple brands here you may not be familiar with, so somebody might ask, well, what is Trip Pack? In the trucking industry, um, there's a thing called bills of lading. It's basically a piece of paper that says what I'm hauling in the truck. I picked it up from this uh, warehouse and I'm delivering it to this customer. Uh, like any other business, it's the paper that allows people to get paid. Trip Pack is a subsidiary of Xerox, and essentially it's uh, the ability to scan electronically those documents uh, at the warehouse location or on the route. Typically what they'll do is a driver will stop in for his fuel stop, he or she, come into one of our facilities where we have trip pack uh, equipment and facilities at each location. and They scan electronically those documents and ship them back to the home office. That allows the, uh, the fleet to get paid more in a more timely manner as well as providing feedback uh, to the customers about the status of their, uh, their load. Another interesting business case study that I wish I'd studied years ago was uh, a company called Cat Scales. I used to see these signs on the highway. I wondered what they were. Every truck that goes down the highway today has to have an independent weight certification. And so typically after they've either loaded or unloaded, they'll go to a truck stop like ours where there's a set of pull on and off weight uh, uh, equipment that allows them to have a piece of paper that says we weighed in at uh, 81,000 gross vehicle pounds or whatever. Catscales almost has a monopoly in this industry. They're a privately held company based in Iowa and they do quite well, but we're proud to be a partner of theirs and we have their, their scales at almost all of our facilities.
our business, like many, is always changing. And uh, we used to say it's a simple business. You, you sell a gallon of diesel fuel and you might sell a, a Coca-Cola to go with it and drivers go on their road. Today, uh, we have a variety of different fuels and additives that we have to deal with. Um, uh, within the last five or six years, we've shifted from what used to be called low sulfur diesel. I know this is a dangerous acronym to use in this crowd, but it was referred to as LSD. Um, Today it's called ULSD, Ultra Low Sulfur Diesel. Uh, as part of our environmental uh, shift, uh, they've reduced the parts per million from 500 of sulfur in every gallon to uh, less than 50. Keeps the emissions cleaner. That was a major conversion for our industry. All the tanks and the pipelines and, and the storage facilities had to be cleansed and, and changed over. Um, the most recent change to, to that environmental compliance has been something we call diesel exhaust fluid. So now the, the engine of the truck using ultra-low sulfur diesel, after it's been combusted in the chamber and out the exhaust uh, pipe, it's sprayed with a fluid called uh, diesel exhaust fluid. It's basically a, a, a nitrogen-based product that cleanses the exhaust even further before it uh, goes out the tailpipe. For the industry to have that diesel exhaust fluid handy, we spent over $125 million in capital to dig up our, our tanks and our lines to install underground tanks, add dispensers, so that every day that new type of truck, and they're transitioning still in our industry, could have both its diesel and diesel exhaust fluid. Further to that, uh, our friends in Washington have also mandated what we call biodiesel, and in many states we're now required to pump biodiesel, which the simple way to think of it is we've taken ultra-low sulfur diesel, we've added some soybean-based components to it, uh, we try to stay away from the uh, McDonald's french fry kind of stuff, um, and, and uh, it keeps our biodiesel running a, a little cleaner, but that stretches basically our carbon-based uh, products, and uh, we've had to add biodiesel to our tanks as well. So we've got different products to, to segregate as we go through the, uh, uh, the logistics of keeping our, our sites wet. The latest uh, example of this is, is liquid natural gas. So uh, I feel somewhat like uh, folks must have felt years ago when, when trucks all ran on gasoline back in the uh, 20s and 30s and suddenly somebody said, what about diesel? Today we accept it, like it was always been there for diesel. But natural gas has come on very strong, both in its liquid form and compressed form. Um, Monday, May the 5th, I believe, we're going to open up our first new liquid natural gas facility out in uh, the Los Angeles, California area. And we will probably have about 100 of these built across the country over the next four to five years in partnership with Shell Oil. So again, uh, the variety of fuels is changing. And that means changes for uh, how we maintain those vehicles and how we uh, supply them around the country. One of the things I think that's key about us is our culture. And it's really about, uh, everybody's got bricks and mortar out there. Um, but about five years ago, Tom O'Brien, one of the great things about Tom is he's not from this industry. So he came in with a fresh perspective. He is from the hospitality and hotel business. He looked at our, our business and he said, man, I don't know. I don't know if we're satisfying the needs of, the, of our primary customer, the drivers, or not. Let's, uh, let's go out and listen to them. And most of us in senior management at the time kind of thought, you know, that's not such a good idea, taking a brand new CEO out to talk directly to your customer. They might say things about my activity or ours or Tom's that we're not a little comfortable with. And so we'd like to maybe filter that. Let's maybe do a survey or hire a consulting firm. Tom wasn't having any of that. Uh, in fact, that's one of his uh, uh, main tenets that I've come to admire is he wants to go right to the source, cut out all the middlemen, and find out exactly what people are saying. And so we, we waded into that kind of an activity, and uh, about five years ago we started it. Tom Litkus organized a bunch of meetings around the country with, uh, with truck drivers. They had no idea we were coming. We would show up, and about an hour before the meeting, we would offer a free dinner or a lunch. And uh, truck drivers are, are pretty good about taking advantage of those things. They'd sit in a room with about 10 of us around the table. 
and they'd enjoy a meal. And hopefully they didn't make some of us executives the meal because they would provide direct feedback, particularly when you get them on a roll. Truck drivers are very clear and concise uh, about their opinions. But they told us great things. They, seriously, they did. They told us about parking issues. They told us about uh, lines at the registers. They told us about the receipts that maybe the ink faded on before they got home and they needed to have that for tax purposes. They asked us about could we offer healthier menu items and things like that. And Tom O'Brien, to his credit, and our team, we took all of those things dutifully down and we would go back and we would meet and we would talk about how could we satisfy those needs. I'll show you a couple of examples here in a minute about how we launched into that. But that act of meeting directly with customers without any fancy consultants or any of that kind of stuff um, sets the tone for your management team. It says it's okay to go and listen and sometimes the comments weren't very nice. Uh, the restroom at that site in Dallas, you know, every time I go in there, there's no paper towels. Well, by golly, we fix those kind of things because we don't want to be caught like that in another conversation. And so that has kind of provided the basis for our management culture. Uh, so that was step one, listening to your customer and acting upon it. Today, I'm proud Tom, Tom Luxus keeps a list of about 60 or 70 items over the last four and a half, five years that we've heard from customers and what have we done to act upon those things, right? In a similar way, Ara over here was the leader in then taking that and saying, well, how do we sensitize our frontline management team, our cashiers, our, our technicians, our waiters and waitresses in the restaurants so that they understand what a driver goes through every day? Because not everybody appreciates the life of a driver. So we first created, his team did a video uh, that provides a little vignette of the week uh, of a driver's activities. And every one of our employees, both new and existing, goes through that and revisits it periodically to remind themselves that a driver's day can be up or down. Uh, basically the premise of our video is uh, here's, a, here's a guy who just gets on the road, says goodbye to his family on a Sunday night. During the week his son calls him on Wednesday and tells him he's just made the basketball team. There's a game on Friday and dad's going to be home to see it, aren't you dad? And the dad says sure. And, and uh, somewhere around Thursday he finds out that he's going to take a load because another driver called in sick and things like that. So we, we stop the video along the way and we talk to our employees about the impact they can have on that driver's week or that day. We call it be a day maker. You can make their day by being the one voice that talks to them and provides them maybe with a piece of uh, pie as a complimentary dessert or uh, we've helped families out who had uh, medical issues along the route and other things. And it's really kind of empowered our folks on the front line and we get lots of great feedback and anecdotes about it today. So you have to instill that culture and I'm proud to say we have throughout our organization and it continues to help us every day and set us apart from some of our, our other competitors. Here's one of, one of my favorites. This is how you take uh, uh, lemons and turn it into lemonade. Probably the lowest self-esteem employee at the truck stop is the poor son of a gun who cleans the showers and the bathrooms. And those folks used to kind of mope around with their heads down and kind of try to stay below the radar. Well, we took that situation and turned it around and said, you know what, these are actually our most important folks because if you're driving a truck, uh, living in the parking lots and sleeping in the cab, you really appreciate a good, clean shower and a soft set of towels and things like that. So we totally revamped our shower cleaning activity and we created a little buzz called the Dream Team of Clean. We took the folks that were used to kind of not having any eye contact with people and we dressed them up and we gave them a training program, gave them all new equipment, name tags, business cards, and I tell you what, it did a wonder for them and they're so proud and we get so many compliments about the cleanliness of our restrooms and showers now. And it's all because we turned it around at that frontline employee. We, like many in the hospitality business, have our own loyalty club program. Uh, many of you, when you get out of school, or some of you in the audience, have a hotel club card or an airline club card. Truck drivers are the same way. They have a loyalty club a program. Ours has continuously been recognized as the best in the industry. It's often copied. 
and we continue to improve it and stay ahead of the game. We offer special loyalty club programs for different groups of drivers like bus drivers and, and expediters who are a special category of truck driver. But we continuously listen to the customers, <clears throat> we ask them what they need, and we modify our program accordingly. We continuously get positive feedback uh, from our customers about that program. Just like the rest of the population, health and fitness is a big issue for drivers. The average truck driver's lifespan is about 60 years old. That's a pretty sobering thought. And you ask yourself, well, why is that? Uh, drivers are just like you and me. But they live a very sedentary lifestyle on the road, and they eat a lot of fast food, and they don't have a lot of opportunities to exercise. The industry has been trying to recognize that in the last few years. We've taken a lead role through many of our programs. And again, this is where the merger of our, our parent firm, who's big in the hotel business, has helped us. We've created fitness centers, much like you'd see at a Hampton Inn or a Holiday Inn Express or that kind of thing in our facilities. We have walking trails. Uh, there's maps we hand out for that kind of stuff. And more importantly, my sales team and I can go out to fleet customers who also are offering wellness programs for drivers. And we can reinforce that wellness activity while the driver's on the road. Coach them to eat the healthy meals we have on our menu. Uh, they get asked, did you go to the fitness center, the TA or the Petro today? Uh, did you walk the, uh, the three-mile walk that they have mapped out for you? So all of those things, we're very proud and, and uh, take a lead role in our industry um, uh, at the site level. <clears throat> Here's another one. This is my last plug for Ara Bagdasarian, you know. He, uh, I kid him, he's got a good hard head and, and uh, he's like, like me in that regard. About four or five years ago, most of us in this room, now I know you're a younger crowd, most of us wouldn't have even known really what an app was. And today we, we roll that phrase off uh, all the time like it was a piece of sliced bread or something. Well, we didn't have an app a few years ago. Um, Ara thought that it would be a good idea for us to have one. Uh, most of the management was kind of saying, yeah, we got enough on our plate right now, we don't need an app. But to his credit, he fought through that and we, we launched our first app a few years ago. It was wildly successful. And today we are recognized as a leader in our industry for having a, a very singular, unified application. And anybody who's got an iPhone or an Android, I'd encourage you to download it. It's free. Provides a, a map of our facilities. Uh, provides real-time pricing. And more importantly, if you were a truck driver, you can call and schedule uh, planned maintenance on that device. You can call in for emergency maintenance, and it will it will read to us your latitude and longitude so we can directly make sure that our, our emergency vehicle gets out to your precise location. Um, and you can schedule things like a shower before you get to the facility because there's always a waiting line for some of those things for the drivers. So uh, uh, we're very proud of the app and it was all created in-house. Uh, productivity, uh, like any business, as I mentioned earlier, We've continuously thought about how we could take what a driver needed and provide that as a service. And one of the things drivers have always told us is, I don't know where the parking spots are on the highway. I'm in Texas today, I'm in New York State tomorrow, I'm in California the next day. I've got limited hours that I'm required to uh, drive by, and I've got to have a, a parking spot. So we, we brainstormed a lot of high-tech ideas, and at the end of the day we went and kept it simple. We told our site managers, <coughs> excuse me, we told our site managers every two hours we want you or your designate, designee to go out in the parking lot and count the number of spaces that are open. And we post that number into a central database that allows us then to post it on our, our application on the iPhone or the Android. And drivers can now go down the road and they know that within two hours that's a pretty accurate number. We further then extended that by offering what we now call reserve it parking. Uh, and reserve it parking is like a guaranteed late arrival for you and I at a hotel. The driver can actually, for a small fee, reserve a spot and we'll guarantee it for 24 hours so they can drive up to their maximum limit on the highway. It makes them more productive, the fleet more productive, and we're happy to have the revenue. So that's one of those things about listening to your customer and then trying to figure out how to take advantage of it in-house. Uh, finally, 
dr truck drivers, uh, like many in this industry, are often maligned and, and they don't get a lot of good PR. And we see plenty of examples every day of what we call heroes of the highway. And so we took that thought and created an award we call the Citizen Driver Award. And it's more than just a guy who, uh, or a person I should say, a, a man or a woman, who's driving down the highway who's a safe driver. Lots of fleets give awards for that and we're very proud of those as well. But this takes it a step further and says, you know, truck drivers, for all the time they're on the road, a lot of them are pillars of their community. They're in the Boy Scouts or the church or they're doing some things in the YMCA or a Little League team. We ought to recognize those folks. Well, we kicked that program off. Tom Lucas and his team did a marvelous job of, of getting input from drivers across fleets and independent drivers. We had an esteemed panel of judges from across the industry who selected the award winners. And the coolest thing about it is the award is not just a plaque. The award for these citizen drivers is you get your name on your favorite truck stop within our network. So if you drive down Interstate 71 and 76 here, we've got a facility called, it says the Lodi Travel Center on the, on the blue band. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a blue band. Um, we're going to rename that facility in the honor of some truck driver. In fact, many of us are going to be going out here in the month of May and uh, uh, kicking off those uh, unveilings of the new names. But the driver got to select, he or she, their favorite TA Petro facility, and we're going to put their name on it. Now, Tom O'Brien, you know, kind of challenged us on that one because uh, we started doing the math and we figured, well, uh, we could go for about 40 more years and most of us would be retired by then. That's going to be somebody else's problem to figure out how many, how many more sites we're going to need to keep this program alive. But I think we're good for about 40 years and it's a tremendous honor for the, uh, for the recipients. They're just proud as they could be with their families and the local dignitaries to be there. And we think it sends a, a strong message within the industry. How we go to market, uh, I'll make this relatively quick. Uh, again, some of you marketing students here, uh, we go in what we call B2B, business to business, and B2C, business to customer. Um, my sales team goes out and we talk to uh, corporate and private fleets, uh, and we talk to the senior executives who, who want to know that they can get fuel at a reasonable price and have adequate parking and truck service for their, for their fleet while it's on the road. And then we ultimately talk to the individual owner operator. Many, many truck drivers down the road just own their own rig and they vote with their wallet. And we always want to make sure that particularly that driver is making the positive selection uh, because of the nature of our facilities and our offer. And so we're very proud that uh, year in and year out, I'm going to pass you this next slide. We're very proud of the fact that every year there's an independent survey that just drivers vote on, and every year we are the majority winner. There's 42 categories this year. We were the number one rated or number two rated in 36 out of 42. And the reason that's important is because, number one, it's independent drivers, whether they work for a fleet or are on their own, but drivers within a fleet can move from one fleet to another. So if a guy's working for Schneider today, I want to make sure that he's got a positive feeling and is asking to be able to fuel or stop at our facilities when he or she leaves and goes to another trucking firm like uh, Warner as an example. So, uh, so that's how we go to market. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to pause and wrap it up. So uh, before I offer questions or comments, here's what I hope you took from this. Um, here we are in good old Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, with one of the largest truck stop chains uh, as your neighbor. We're very proud of our heritage here. I hope you get a better understanding of the type of business we run around the country. It's a very complicated business, lots of moving parts, and we have direct control of most or all of them, which means that none of us ever really get a break. It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Freight is moving and trucks are hauling. But within that framework, I think the key for, for our success has been empowering our frontline personnel to understand who the customer is that they're servicing every day and constantly listening to our customer. So with that, I hope, uh, I hope you've gotten something out of the presentation and I'm open to any questions or comments anybody may have from the audience. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you 
have any plans to go international? The question was, do we have any plans to go international? Excellent question. We actually have uh, one truck stop in Ontario, Canada. Um, it was actually part of an expansion plan that we had uh, considered prior to our current ownership coming in. Since that time, the economy has been such that we've been focused on opportunities within the uh, uh, lower 48 states. But from time to time, we take a look at South America and China. Uh, we have hosted a couple of groups from those countries who are interested in our truck stop industry and we've seen some opportunities there but so far we've had enough on our plate in the domestic U.S. Uh, to stay, stay focused here but Tom O'Brien's a creative guy and I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, he kind of might stroll into our office one day and say hey guys we're going to China and we'd all have to gear up for it. Good question. Yes sir. Uh, does your company offer the uh, discounts to the uh to the drivers, uh, and there's another the small trucker has three or four trucks. Joe Blow has 36 trucks, etc. And there's the things we've heard with Haslam's folks, uh, what they have done and what they haven't done. Uh, to me, if I were a small driver, I would certainly like to get a, a fair um, discount on my fuel. If I'm, you know, trying to make money, that's one way for me to maybe make an extra buck or two. So I just wonder what you're doing. Sure, good, good question. For all of you who might not have heard, it was about discounts for small truckers relative to large trucks and that sort of thing. Uh, first of all, as a good sales guy, I try to avoid the word discount, right? That's, I'm, I'm coached with that constantly. Um, but obviously, uh, as in any industry, folks who are very large have what we call leverage, and so we have to be competitive. We're very proud of the fact that our mix of customers is quite different from my competitors, Pilot Flying J and Loves. What I mean by that is we lead the industry with small trucking uh, companies and independent owner operators who frequent our facilities. We have our share of the large fleets, but we don't cater as much or discount as much to them as, we, as the other guys do. On the other hand, we do work with a lot of what I would call co-op type groups where it's a large group of independent owner operators and trucking owners who might have four or five trucks, they band together yeah, there's three or four or five organizations like that, and we work with them and, and provide them a discount overall so that each of them uh, is able to gain the leverage of the, of the group, if that makes sense. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, when do you go report your uh, fourth quarter 2013 results? You know, I think any day now. In fact, uh, we're, we're working with the auditors as a public company does on that, so uh, I don't have a specific date in mind, but I know the folks are working on that. Um, I'm not an auditor type, but I will share a story with you that apparently this year is uh, a new set of rules for public company auditors, and uh, they're being very cautious this year, as they always are. Uh, they want to make sure they're not going to be subject to any lawsuits down the road or, or et cetera. So I've heard of a couple of other public companies who were extremely well scrutinized this year, I'll say it that way, and, and we're, we're in that same mix. Yes, sir? You mentioned there was a significant history of acquisition in terms of getting some of your facilities, and I was wondering over the past five or ten years what the percentage of uh, growth in the company was in terms of organic versus M&A activity. Yeah, the question was about uh, organic versus M&A activity. I would say uh, much of our activity has been through mergers and acquisitions. Uh, the key one being uh, what are in the late 90s with uh, Union 76. The big merger was the joining of uh, TA in 76 and it went from like 48 to 130 locations just like that. Yeah, the, if you, there used, used to be an oil company called Union 76 out on the west coast. They had a, a chain of truck stops. It was predominant in the country and at the time when travel centers was private uh, the two companies merged together and that, that as he pointed out, put us into the, the big leagues with uh, about 150 or so locations. In 2007, uh, we were acquired by our current owner, Hospitalities Properties Trust, in January of that year. And in May of that year, they acquired our, our number one competitor, Petro Stopping Centers, out of El Paso, Texas. Um, today, we probably have about uh, a dozen vacant pieces of property in our inventory. Um, 
but honestly, the last four or five years with the downturn in the economy, there have been more opportunistic buys for real estate with existing sites that we could uh, remodel and fix up versus a ground up new build. However, we have plans for uh, two or three ground up new builds this year. Yes. I get the sense that you rely upon uh, a large number of customer facing employees to fulfill the brand promise in a, in a fairly consistent way. And in terms of fulfilling that culture throughout the workforce, can you talk about employee retention? And can you also talk about, uh, you talked about some training methodologies you have to instill that, but what I'm especially interested in is senior tenure employees, customer facing, how does their nuance get instilled within newer employees? Do you do that systematically? How does that happen? Sure, uh, I think you could all hear the question about employee retention and culture and, and instilling that, I think, throughout what I'll call the chain of command, both uh, newer employees and, and uh, experienced employees. Uh, well, first of all, it, it starts really with, with walking the talk. And I think we try to do that uh, in, in each of our, our business segments. And uh, we're a, a multi-billion dollar company, but I often refer to us as really a, a small company uh, culture. Uh, I've worked for big companies, British Petroleum, Ford Motor, and the Uncle Sam's Army. They had lots of layers and lots of rules and regulations. We don't have a lot of that at all. Uh, there's very few layers, there's probably four or five layers between the a frontline employee and Tom O'Brien. Um, and as such, we're relatively lean. We don't have a lot of fancy management committee meetings and uh, uh, committees and things like that. Um, and so people see that that culture and they take their lead from the, the mannerisms of the uh, senior team. Uh, so it's very visible. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we systematically take all new employees who go through the, uh, the day in the life of the driver training that I mentioned earlier, as well as some other training. And so far as retention goes, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I know, for example, in ARA's area, technicians, uh, technicians are always moving around in the auto industry, uh, at a dealership or independent repair shops, and truck stops are no different. But our retention has continuously improved for our technicians, and we're very proud of that. Ari, maybe you want to speak sure. to that? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. It's not easy to answer because the whole retention. I had 3,000 employees. I'm sorry. I had 3,000 employees, and uh, I guess the concept that we'd say is, would your son or daughter want to come to work for you? Think about that. Walk around your facility. If you're going to interview somebody and walk them through the facility, uh, how do you treat your employees? And there's a number of things you have to do. First orientation, uh, this whole Q4 day maker, it, you have to be relentless. You have to have shift meetings. You have to do a number of things because, as Mike said, this is a tough business. It's a 724, and people don't leave companies, they leave managers. So, what we have to do every day is try to figure out how to make a 724 uh, truck stop travel center business somewhere that people want to work, recognizing birthdays and I mean, I could go through a lot, but uh, if you want to talk on a, on a sidebar, but there's a whole process that you have to walk the talk. Uh, it's orientation, it's how you treat people, recognizing birthdays. Uh, uh, in truck service, we actually uh, have a program called uh, Q-Force where we award capes to people by doing special things. And it, uh, uh, we have a recognition ceremony where we actually award capes to people uh, we have a webinar every 60 days where we recognize special stories. So uh, the answer isn't an easy one, but it's, it, there's a whole uh, a hard work, and it's really uh, thinking about the concept of uh, would you want your son or daughter to come work for you, and are you treating people? It's, it's how you treat your customers and yeah. how you treat your employees. It's more than money. Yeah. Uh, a lot of yeah. folks don't really care so much about the money as do you treat me like a human being and an individual? Do you recognize that special talent that I bring to the service bay or to the waitress waitressing, that kind of thing? So Maybe I'll just close with a, like a simple concept would be, uh, it would be uh, if watching how if you greeted a driver by name, he's got his name tag on and we have our loyalty program, how the whole transaction changes when you greet somebody by name, how they react to that. Or, uh, you know, the guy's wearing a Green Bay Packers hat and you say, hey, you know, uh, it, you know, it's too bad Brett Farr retired for the third time. So there's a whole lot of things that you can do to treat 
people differently, and, 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 and so there's no magic dust. It's, it's really, but, but it's recognizing that you, uh, how you treat your employees and how you treat your customers is the only thing that can really differentiate you. Uh, and maybe the other point in Mike's presentation I want to make sure you get is that driver retention and finding and keeping drivers is the number one uh, challenge if you ask a trucking company. And that's why our strategy is built around amenities and full service and showers because drivers have a lot to do with who they drive for and the conditions over the road making it, uh, what is it, 80% turnover now, Mike? Uh, it's as high as 120% at many of the public fleets. That's a staggering number when you think about it for, uh, for those guys. But yet there are fleets that uh, retention for, or the turnover, I should say, for drivers is only 20%. So there's a huge gap, and you can tell it in just how they take care of their folks. And our management turnover is, let's say, between 15 and 20 percent at the general manager level and maybe in the mid to high 20s at the assistant manager level if you were so that's a that's a, a major accomplishment in a business that's open 724 and 40 states so yes sir uh, do you have a um, um, plan for your um, five-year growth for your sales and earnings you know that's really somewhere up here in Tom O'Brien's head uh, and I mean that literally because uh, he challenges us uh, to continue to grow, but he hasn't set a particular number out there. And uh, he, he's, he's a very ambitious uh, leader in terms of uh, looking at acquisitions. Uh, we have, uh, I'll say, made a run at some rather large ones lately that I can't comment on publicly. But uh, uh, he's not shy about looking at growth. Um, what would you identify as your biggest challenge within your company going forward the next 10 to 20 years and within the uh, truck stop industry, the service industry? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, obviously, we see continued regulations within our industry, so truck drivers are currently at a premium. They're becoming more of a premium because, let's face it, not too many folks today want to encourage their sons or daughters to be a truck driver. Uh, but yet we need a good solid pipeline of drivers coming into the industry. You can make a decent wage as a driver. But it's almost like being a pilot, if I can say it that way, and I hope I don't offend I'm anybody here. That word, Mike. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, another pilot. But um, there's more regulations, there's fewer hours that you can actually drive the truck, and so that puts a further strain on the resource. We've got multiple types of fuel out there, continued uh, emissions issues. Uh, and the whole notion of just-in-time logistics uh, is something we're all challenged with, if that helps you. Fuel, too. Yes, sir. In the back. Yeah, you're uh, in an interesting position as a public company and your two major competitors are private companies. I wonder if this might not be uh, right, may not be the right guy to talk about this, but uh, I wonder if you could uh, share your perspective on the advantages and disadvantages of uh, being public versus your competitors? Yeah, that's an excellent question. and um, we, we deal with that every day, as, as you might assume. Um, our competition doesn't have to go in and talk about uh, any of their issues of earnings going up or down or why their stock price is going up or down or explaining an acquisition that they're, they've just completed or, or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, in particular with the situation that occurred, today's the anniversary of a year ago of a particular raid down in Tennessee, um, that kind of forced our competitors to take a more public approach than they're used to because they really haven't had anybody looking over their shoulder. We on the other hand have, and, and we deal with it every day, it requires a lot more rigor of our financial statements and our processes and we have to justify and, and uh, uh, describe, I'll say, uh, many of our situations that others don't have to even deal with. Um, by and large, many of the public companies we deal with as, as customers understand that and they give us credit for it. Some of the private fleets don't quite understand it uh, and they're not quite used to it. So we deal with it uh, in a very professional way and we're very proud and we can always say, and particularly it's actually been an advantage for us in the last 12 months to say, look, we've always been transparent. We got lots of eyes on our books and our numbers and our processes and we don't have anything to hide. Come on in any day and take a look at how we do discounts or rebates and those kinds of things. Uh, so 
I would say generally over the last 12 months or so, it's actually been a plus. Last question. Uh, what accommodations, if any, do you make for drivers of recreational vehicles? Um, help me understand that. You mean uh, if a driver comes in and has like a, a bicycle or a motorcycle or something like that yeah, with his truck? Recreational vehicle drivers. Uh, RV. Oh, RV. Sorry. Uh, yeah. so that, that's what I was wondering. Okay. Um, you know what? We looked at the RV business. Uh, we've looked at it several times, but most recently about three years ago. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of RVs out on the highway, but typically at travel centers, uh, number one, they don't spend a lot of money there. They take up a lot of room, and typically they use us as a sanitary fill. Well, what we've discovered through a lot of research is the typical RV customer goes to a Target or a Walmart or whatever stocks up their refrigerator and their goodies. They go on down the highway, and when they need a biological break, they'll look for a truck stop because they generally have more room than a gas station, uh, and off they go. So our our average ticket compared to the investment we'd have to make to support them has not been that strong. So we've kind of looked at that segment and said we can probably reinvest our dollars in a, in a more efficient way uh, with limited dollars available. Does that help you? Quick question. Uh, what are you doing regarding hiring the veterans? <laughs> Good question. Um, we're very active in uh, hiring veterans, particularly in our technician ranks. I recognize the face back there. Um, uh, one of my fellow alumni. But uh, yeah, we have a, an active program for hiring veterans, particularly in the uh, technician area, but also in all facets of our, uh, of our recruiting. In fact, we work with a number of organizations uh, specifically just to target those things, and we go to some of the veterans' job fairs around the country. With that, I think I'm out of time. I thank you all for your attention and hope you uh, learned some things. Students, wait for two and a half minutes. You will get to your next class. Uh, too much bedlam when everybody starts taking off, so just wait a couple minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lombardi, for representing uh, your company, and uh, Mr. O'Brien as a 58th Mellon Series speaker, and your excellent informative presentation today, and for you and Mr. O'Brien's outstanding contribution to the Mellon Series. Uh, T.J. Killian, is here to give you a couple of minor gifts that we Thank you, TJ Clean. Uh, before we start the reception, a brief recognition is needed for those that have helped serve us in uh, putting together this presentation, for aiding us at Travel Centers of America and making the presentation possible. Thomas Lucas is here, uh, Vice President Marketing and Public Relations. And then I go into the John Carroll. At John Carroll, special thanks go to my assistant, Kathleen Stover, who made all the arrangements for this and uh, makes me look successful, so I'm very pleased with her help. Uh, I also thank the Bowler Finance Association uh, student volunteers for being with us and helping us today. And last, as a combination of both uh, John Carroll University and as uh, 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 Travel Centers of America. I want to recognize, and uh, for a couple minutes, uh, Ara Bagsterian, who is here. Thank you. And, and uh, he was at the Bowler School of Business, uh, graduated in 1978 uh, with a major in marketing. And obviously, he's done well with that. Uh, <laughs> he will be retiring this year from his position as, exec as Executive Vice President after 36 years of service at Travel Centers uh, and his predecessors. Next in his life, he plans to spend more time improving the services to individuals with de developmental disabilities while serving his role as President of the Cuyahoga County Board of Development, de Developmental Disabilities. This Dedication is consistent with a character and contribution to others held by JCU and our graduates. I'm pleased to have you here with us today. Uh, Mr. Beck Sarian, thank you for being here. In closing, we look forward to seeing you for the next Mountain Series speaker. The one we had planned uh, is uh, 
going to probably do it spring term, and so we're still looking for a fall term, but that information will be available reasonably soon. The reception now continues to 7 o'clock. Michael Lombardi will be available during the reception if you would like to talk with them. And thank you all for coming, and students you can go too.